So, uh, lords, ladies, gentlemen, honoured guests, it's my very great pleasure to welcome you all today to Imperial College for the President's um, address and reception. This is actually the third time that Alice has given um, an, an, an address, and it's becoming an annual event and a highlight in the College's calendar. It's an opportunity for Alice to reflect on last year, of course, but also set out some thoughts on the most important challenges facing us for the coming year and the approach, the strategic approach to, to dealing with those challenges. The theme of Alice's address this year is going to be those challenges and the benefits of having patience. So I don't know any more about this than you do. I'm very interested to hear what Alice has to say about patience. Um, particularly in these times of change, it's very important for us to be able to step back and look at things from a, from a high level. And I think that's, the, that's where we're looking, that's where we're heading uh, at the moment. Good decisions, rather like excellent research and, and, and good teaching, outstanding education, those things all take time. After the address, there's going to be a reception in the Queen's um, Tower Rooms, which is just um, outside of this building, where you came in. Um, to celebrate Imperial's achievements across the world last year and to highlight a number of the amazing achievements that we have had uh, from more than 200 college staff and alumni who've been recognised through awards and honours and prizes. It's an extraordinary achievement, I think. Um, many of these award winners are attending tonight, so you'll get the chance to talk to some of them at the reception afterwards. And their names are all in the little booklet that you found on your chair. As Chair of Council, I'm delighted to have Alice as our President. She continues to increase the College's international and domestic profile. She's contributed a lot towards the post-referendum debate in the country, with articles in the national press and indeed the international media. And these have, uh, I think, been very helpful. They are all along the lines of what would Imperial College like it to look like in the post-Brexit phase. We're not grumbling, we're not wanting to change decisions that have already been taken. And we try to steer a clear path in this changing world. She's advising the Mayor of London on what Brexit means and what it means for higher education here in London. So, um, Alice, without further ado, I'm delighted to introduce you, the President, Professor Alice Gast. Thank you very much, Philip. Um, before I start, I'd just like to say that our thoughts are with those who were affected by the tragic events of Parliament uh, earlier today. And just to say that we will not let acts of violence prevent us from our important work. I'm very glad that we have the chance to come uh, together as a community and to celebrate the successes you've seen on the screen this evening. And I think celebrating those successes and pursuing our work is more important than ever, so thank you all for being here. We do gather this afternoon to celebrate and pay tribute to some of our friends, alumni, and colleagues who have received external honors this year. And the honors, as you've seen, range from national honors bestowed by Her Majesty the Queen to Fellowship of the Royal Society, medals, prizes, honorary degrees, best papers, and entrepreneurial prizes. I note particularly Professor Tom Kibble's posthumous recognition with the Institute of Physics Isaac Newton Medal, and I welcome his family here tonight. Congratulations to you all. You inspire us. Since moving to London, I've become quite a fan of making and drinking tea. Tea is a social drink. It is more than a beverage. It is an occasion a brief time out from the pressures of the day. Many moments in life require time to sit down, take stock, and talk to someone or think about something. These times call for a cup of tea. It takes time to make proper tea. There is the ritual of filling and turning on the kettle, waiting for the boiling that seems so robust in a proper British kettle, preparing the tea, letting it steep, and letting it cool before drinking it. Having tea forces me to slow down. It reminds me of the importance of patience. 
I am not a patient person next challenge to find a solution to get done the many things on my to-do list. We are now a couple of years into the college strategy a bit in these years, and today we are launching a new website to celebrate our actions, to assess our project, progress, and review our work in the context of the strategy. The world looks very different now than it did in 2015. Our strategy has evolved because of this, and that is good. In a world where information is at our fingertips, where news is instant and communication rapid, we have become accustomed to thinking and acting quickly. We have forgotten the value and the necessity of patience. When I first decided to talk about patience in this address, I had no idea how much the anxiety, how much anxiety would be created by the rapid and poorly thought out decisions affecting the world on a daily basis, not to mention the tragic events such as the one today. We have witnessed astounding things, weakened judicial rulings, hate crimes, missile tests, and divisive words uttered, retracted, and promulgated once again. The past year of unexpected political events and the impact by uncertain How will we navigate what is ahead? Much of the discussion around Brexit is focused on short-term issues, yet there are many complicated things to be negotiated, and we understand that these negotiations will take time. We need to, and we are, trying as hard as we can to take a long view on Brexit and on the many other things going on. There are, however, some things we must be proactive about. We need to know, right now, that imperial colleagues who are EU citizens today to stay. And we will do our best to let our European colleagues know just how much we want them to stay. And I think we should all let them know. Whenever the our natural human desire is to do something, while we all should be trying to do the right thing, to help out and make our values clear, it seems to me that we also need to try our best to be patient. We sometimes need to step back. Just as there is a time for action, so too is there a time for assessment and reflection. As scholars, we are accustomed to the long, deliberate process of research. We appreciate the understanding that we tome. We know that research and education take time, and we know that this time invested is well worth the wait. We must take the discipline of the academy, so well honed by centuries of learned academics, and make it work for us. We must make it work in a world where we are conditioned to seize opportunities, to file a patent, answer a tweet, or to catch an airplane. These times require patience. I want to share my thoughts on five areas where I think patience is important for Imperial. The first two are at the heart of our mission, research and teaching. The other three areas are translation of discovery, partnerships, and philanthropy, all are central to our strategy. So I begin with research. Funding for research brings accountability. Everyone wants to see resources put to good use. We are impatient for results. In some instances, lives depend on our new discoveries. In other cases, there is pressure to create jobs, to beat our competitors, or to tout new breakthroughs in the media. We are all driven towards results and answers. But we must not neglect the long, slow, and careful process essential to excellent research. In the modern day frenzy for impact, we need to continually remind ourselves and our supporters that long-term fundamental research 
takes time. We know from experience that the wait is worth it. Think of some of the incredible breakthroughs that have happened after years, decades even, of hard work and patience. Like Professor Steve Bloom's pioneering discovery of several gut hormones and their influence on appetite regulation and their role as neurotransmitters. His research since the 1980s led to appetite reduction therapies brought to society through two spin-out companies. Initial tests show that people consume fewer calories when they eat a meal after taking the hormones. He is now working on an EU-funded project with Professor Chris Tumazu on a microchip to recognize and process signatures of appetite, mimic instructions to the brain, and reduce the urge to eat. These revolutionary advances came some 30 years after the initial discovery. Supporting new, risky, groundbreaking research is a priority for Imperial. It was the reason we established the Excellence Fund for Frontier Research. These programs will take time, courage, and fortitude to be successful, but we hope that government, foundations, and philanthropists will take note, and they will follow our example by adding their support. It is critically important to support hard research that takes time. We must make the case for looking to the long term with regard to research, and we must not rush forward with research solely dri driven by short-term needs and problems. We do welcome the steadfast support of government, and especially the new investment of two billion pounds per year by 2020 into research and development. We need to ensure that this investment is made judiciously so that long-term, sustainable, fundamental research is supported so that it has impact on a grander scale. Second, teaching. We also need to be patient in our approach to teaching. We're passionate about teaching students. Education is at the heart of Imperial, and we have generations of stellar alumni who make us very proud of what we do. When I visit our alumni and we talk about their time here, I am struck by how little the essence of an imperial education has changed. We still have extremely rigorous courses that inspire our students to learn, to think, and to dig deeply into themselves to master the concepts. This is the mark of an imperial education. Yet we know that students today are very different than students from the decades past. And we know that the world they will work in has changed significantly. We know that we need to be open to new ideas about the way we teach. But we must do so in a way that does not harm what we are really good at. The new Excellence Fund for Learning and Teaching Innovation has been a catalyst for generating innovative ideas for how we teach at Imperial. These approaches will challenge our students to fulfill their potential, and they will challenge us to deliver a world-class educational experience for all of our students. We support these risky, innovative teaching initiatives while facing new and uncharted territory in the evaluation and assessment of teaching. The Teaching Excellence Framework is an admirable attempt to make our educational offer as accountable as our research excellence. The true challenge is that educational outcomes are difficult to measure. They take time and they require patience to see. And they are not readily put into an analytic framework that provides the desired desired clarity and measure of excellence. <coughs> Advanced education is a means to produce learned members of society and to create an educated workforce. Arising out of both secular and religious organizations, the first universities in the 11th to 13th centuries in Bologna, Oxford, Salamanca, and Paris 
were founded on the belief in the value of gathering teachers and scholars to develop and transmit scientific and scholarly knowledge. The dialogue surrounding the value of a university degree is important, and yet it has lost these founding principles. Today, too often, it is reduced to a discussion of salary, job placement, or a snapshot of student opinion in a survey. There is much more value to our society from our sister system of higher education than we commonly realize. It is hard to imagine where the world would be without the millions of university graduates contributing to society as a whole. How can we measure the value of an educated citizenry? How can we appreciate the lives well lived and the communities that thrive thanks to experiences gained in the formative years in university? We must make the case for looking to the long term with regard to education and not rushing forward with teaching metrics solely driven by short-term measurements. Surveys and salaries are poor proxies for lives well lived, and they do not fully capture the value of a university education. So third, translation of discovery. Perhaps nowhere are we more impatient these days than when we invest in entrepreneurial activities. The promise of a new invention gets everyone excited, from the inventor to the investor to the media. Sometimes that promise is still a long way from certitude, and it may take years to come to fruition. Expectations can get out of hand, and the resulting disappointment may, risk, may increase risk aversion and produce more timid investments in the future. The government's green paper on building an industrial strategy, strategy rightly looks to universities for the research that will bring innovation, and it considers how to better translate discovery into commercial enterprise. But we must take care to protect and support those ideas having great societal but little short-term economic impact we need to provide patient capital and invest in ideas that take longer to develop. I personally believe that it is not government's role to drive innovation. It is something that universities and private enterprise can do best. Government's role is to create and nurture an environment that supports small enterprises and entrepreneurs. I think that we need appropriate tax incentives for startups and small, rapidly growing enterprises. And we need those uh, with a good idea to be able to find space, patient capital, and an environment. At Imperial, we are doing our part to promote innovation amongst our students. With this week being Enterprise Week, we are celebrating this promotion. We have our new Enterprise Lab, the Althea Imperial Program, our Venture Catalyst Challenge, and our incubator at the iHub in White City. We are building these and more. We need partners with patience and foresight, partners to help us make the UK and London the innovation capital of the world. The first of the 10 pillars in the government's green paper is increased investment in science, research, and innovation. I welcome the increased investment However, the emphasis is on the commercialization of the UK science base, and it is critically important that the expectations behind it are realistic. We must make the case for looking to long term with regard to innovation and entrepreneurial activities. Misplaced expectations can do more harm than good, and patience is essential when seeking truly game-changing societal benefit. So number four, partnership. Imperial College London excels at collaboration, like excellence. This is more important than ever as the UK negotiates a relationship with Europe, and we strive to maintain our strong partnerships there. 
We have invested in seed funds for collaborations with MIT and with European colleagues. We will do more of this, and we would like to convince others to support this type of sharing. The UK, like 25 other nations, contributes significant funding to the absolutely unique and groundbreaking facility and research at CERN. The involvement of so many nations and scientists is its strength. What if we took the same approach to working together across nations around the world to tackle antimicrobial resistance, climate change, food or energy supply? We muster some incredibly powerful collaborations to tackle these and other fundamental challenges. Just look at the breakthroughs that the European Research Council has brought about by patient investment in individuals and by fostering European collaboration. The support for Imperial Professor Zoltan Takats and his work on the eye knife allows surgeons to immediately know whether the tissue they are cutting is cancerous or not. Or support for Professor Andrew Davison, whose research into robotic vision enables robots to move beyond controlled environments and successfully navigate the real world. Incidentally, the eye knife is based on electrosurgery, a technology invented in the 1920s, the same decade that the word robot was first used. Once again, we see the virtue of patience. We have excellent corporate partners, and our relationships with them have persisted and grown through multiple economic cycles and leadership transitions. Our partnerships endure because of the great relationships between our staffs working side by side on vexing problems, requiring the very best research by the very smartest people. We know that a partnership is a relationship and it takes time to build true, lasting, and sustainable relationships. Patience is required for strong, lasting partnerships. We must make the case for looking to the long term to ensure that the relationships needed for effective partnerships are sustainable and enduring. Patience and consistency are important in strong partnerships. Finally, philanthropy. Our work would not be possible without the friends, alumni, foundations, staff, and parents who provide the financial support for scholarships, chairs, fellowships, laboratories, classrooms, outreach facilities, prizes, and lectures. They support us because they understand the importance of our work. This support dates back to our foundation. From the financial support to the Royal College of Chemistry in 1845 by landowners, doctors, and manufacturers. To the generous legacies from Alfred Byte in 1906 and Sir Julius Werner in 1912. Over time, many, many more have stepped forward with financial support in order to help advance our mission and our cause. Their names have become part of the fabric of Imperial College. We use and hear these names every day. To give just one example, in 1990, James A. Hartnett made a donation to support an academic post in neurology and mental illness. Mr. Hartnett passed away in 2003, and his generous gift created the Hartnett Chair, today held by Professor David Brooks. Professor Brooks' prodigious research on positron emission tomography and magnetic resonance imaging is helping to understand and treat the progression of Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease. Professor Brooks and his colleagues' work is enhanced by the clinical imaging facility with a new PET scanner in the Wolfson building at our, at our Hammersmith campus. The Wolfson Foundation has invested in breakthrough research and facilities at Imperial since 1959. Their support at that time was instrumental in creating the new biochemistry department and bringing back the Nobel laureate Ernst Chain as its first professor. The foundation has contributed to new centers and laboratories 
having long-lasting impact across the college in areas such as chemistry, genetic therapies, family health, surgical technology, robotic-assisted microsurgery, and education. We honor the patients of the individuals, the alumni, friends, parents, and staff, and the institutions, the trusts and foundations who have stood by us and continue to stand by us as we ask the questions that will lead to greater understanding. Philanthropic support requires trust, and the building of trust takes time. Philanthropists do not make donations lightly. It is our responsibility to show the lasting impact of their gifts, not only at Imperial, but across the world. We need to offer them wonderful opportunities to make a difference in the world through Imperial. In order to establish a stronger philanthropic tradition at Imperial, we must make the case for looking to the long term in building lasting relationships that will benefit society. It is important to be patient and open-minded when developing long-term trusting connections. So I'd like to conclude. Several weeks ago, I had the opportunity to attend the Philanthropreneurship Forum in Vienna. I was inspired by Amr al-Dabach's book, Omnipreneurship, where he describes a holistic, integrated, entrepreneurial attitude toward life. It bears reflection, and I think that there is a great opportunity for us to take stock and to try to live our lives for the larger purpose of building a better world. Whilst in Vienna, I visited Mozart House. I was struck by two things. Firstly, Mozart was so incredibly productive in that house composing some dozens of concertos, five operas, including Figaro, and a symphony in the three years from 1784 to 1787. He said that his productivity bloomed after considerable travels around Europe, lending credence to the idea that working with and experiencing other cultures stimulates intellectual creativity. All the more reason to cherish our international colleagues, collaborations, visitors, and our travels. The second thing that I took from his house was Mozart's inscription, interestingly written in English, in his friend Johann Georg Kronauer's Stammbuch. It says, patience and tranquility of mind contribute more to cure our distempers as the whole art of medicines. The distemper of these times is uncertainty and doubt. In 1787, Mozart understood the curative power of patience and tranquility. The centuries since have not diminished that power. Imperial will continue to move forward. We will continue our tradition of excellence in teaching and research. We will continue our focus on translating great science into enduring benefit for society. We will continue to be a great partner with a global perspective. We will continue to build a lasting philanthropic tradition that will enable Imperial to do even greater things. We will do this through hard work, a commitment to excellence, and of course, patience. Thank you. Before we move across to the reception, I would just like to say a few words of thanks. Um, first, of course, Alice, um, when I got the briefing for today about patience, I was a tiny bit bemused, but I did hear you at the beginning admit that it wasn't your highest virtue. But what you then went on to explain was that taking a long-term view necessarily requires patience, and you did that very eloquently. And Alice, I thank you for a fascinating and thought-provoking address. Thank you. <clears throat> um, Alice Riff, the many staff and alumni of the college, um, the vast majority 
But in the room tonight and some beyond are those who we are celebrating for their dedication and for their achievements, those who have won all those awards. So a very big thank you to all of you. And finally, there are a number of you in this room, well, all of you are supporters of the college, but a number of you are friends and collaborators, um, some of them philanthropists, as you've mentioned, um, uh, Alice, and I'd like to say a very big thank you to all of you who've got here tonight. Sadly, there are some who've got tied up in traffic problems because of the events of today. But thank you all for coming, and um, I'd like to invite you to go to the Queen's Tower for the reception. Thank you. <laughs>